the shadows. False holly in a ring. Twine the branches. Entangle. Enmesh. Spin a spider's web. Hello and welcome back to the Game Master's Domain, where I take things from games and anime and adapt them into D&D 5th Edition. Make sure to check out my Twitter and Patreon, by the way, if you want to help support me in the making of these homebrews. Right now, our goal is to reach 1,000 subscribers by the end of 2022. So if you like what I do here, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Every little bit helps in reaching the goal. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Today we have a new race, and while it doesn't have any one inspiration, it is something that I've wanted to make for some time. And that is the Eeth, a race of dryad-like plant people. I could have just called them dryads, but I decided to go against it just based on the actual D&D lore of the dryads. So with that said, let's head in and see what the Eeth can bring to the party. The Eeth are very closely tied with nature and nature spirits such as dryads, and while some consider them one and the same, the Eeth do not, thinking of themselves simply as plants given will. While they do appear mostly humanoid, at least in their shape, they do often have a green hue to their skin and varying forms of plant growth over their body, such as flowers, vines, bark, or even entire branches. The Eeth are a mostly peaceful people, living in moderately sized groups, usually centered around a large tree somewhere deep in the forest where they can go undisturbed. Although it isn't too uncommon to find them wandering the world in search of rare plants and beautiful sights. In some rare cases, Eeth can be found traveling into desolate areas in order to plant trees and other plants that will help restore the area to its natural state. Now let's move on to how the Eeth actually play with their traits. To start off, they gain a plus two to their wisdom score. Being so close with nature has its perks and gives them plenty of time to learn. Their size is medium, ranging between 4 and 6 feet tall on average, with a 30 foot movement speed. They might be closely related to plants, but they just aren't quite as stationary. The Eeth also age and mature rather slowly, not reaching adulthood until they're 50, and they can live up to 500 years old. In all that time, they learn how to read, write, and speak both common and sylvan, just in case you want to talk to any of the fey friends you may have made during your long childhood. They also gain proficiency in the nature skill via their green thumb ability, and on top of that, their nature's communion ability lets them speak to and understand plants, both the normal variety and the not-so-normal. And the last ability for the Eeth, at least before we get to their subraces, is their druidic magic, which allows them to cast the Entangle and Goodberry spell once per day without using a spell slot, able to hold down your enemies and feed the party, as long as you don't mind your party eating berries that you grow from your own branches. Or they could just be a snack for you, if that's still not too weird. Moving on to those subraces I mentioned, we have two, starting off with the Floral Eeth. These Eeth often live in open meadows with few trees, growing small gardens of flowers, herbs, and other plants. They're notoriously friendly, but also very protective of their plants, seeing them as their own children. These Eeth are more likely to have flowers sprouting from their hair, or in some cases have flowers in place of hair entirely. As for their traits though, they gain a plus one to their dexterity and have two special abilities, the first of which is Toxic Bloom, which gives them resistance to poison damage and advantage against being poisoned. They also know the Poison Spray Cantrip, which uses their Wisdom modifier for casting. Their second ability is Floral Bloom, letting any allied creature within five feet of them use their bonus action to heal by expending their own hit dice. They can use a number of their hit die equal to your Wisdom modifier rounded down, and once a creature is healed in this way, they cannot be healed this way again until they finish a long rest. This does also include you since you are always within 5 feet of yourself. These Eeth lend themselves a bit more to the healer role, but don't let that stop you from being more creative. I think a floral Eeth Ranger would be really fun, especially if they went with Swarm Keeper to have their own personal beehive. Next we have the second subrace, and that is the Thicket Eeth. These Eeth are more akin to trees than flowers and often have thick patches of bark or tree branches growing on their skin. They are a little thicker than their flowery counterparts, with a plus one to their constitution and the sturdy bark ability, giving them an AC equal to 12 plus their constitution modifier when they're not wearing armor or holding a shield. And their last ability is Briars. Seeing as most of these Eeth have some form of sharp thorns on their body, or they're able to push out these thorns on command. This gives the Eeth advantage in all checks against being grappled or breaking free of grapples. And if something does manage to hold onto you, or you manage to hold onto them, they take 1d6 piercing damage at the end of their turn. This damage also does go up as you level, with level 5 being 2d6 and level 7 being 3d6. Now we still have more to do here even though we are done with the main race. First up is the racial feats, of which I made two. And the first one is Branch's Reach. You must be an Eeth to take this feat, 
and when you do, you increase your strength or dexterity score by 1, up to the cap of 20. You increase the reach of all your melee attacks by 5 feet, and you gain an unarmed attack dealing 1d6 plus your strength or dex, whichever one you chose above, in piercing damage. This feat is clearly meant more for close-up fighters like a monk or a fighter, who's going for a more unarmed setup. But a little extra reach is always nice, and being able to deal piercing damage without a weapon is good for dealing with those monsters that resist the normal smashing of unarmed attacks. And there's still one more feat in Dryad's Wisdom. This is more for spellcasters, but there's nothing saying the others can't take it for a little bit more variety. When you take this feat, you learn a few spells. First is Purify Food and Drink, which you can cast as many times as you like per day. Followed by a few more that you can cast once per day each, like Lesser Restoration, Spike Growth, and Enhance Ability. These help you cover a few other bases, such as Basic First Aid, some Base Defense, and a little bit of buffing on the side. Moving on, I made two theme-appropriate spells as well, which are mostly just modified versions of other spells. Starting off, we have Briar Spears, a third level evocation spell with a casting time of one action, a range of 120 feet, and verbal and somatic components. It also has a material component in a Rose Thorn or Briar Thorn. When you cast this spell, you throw three large spears at creatures within range, dealing 2d6 piercing damage. After that, whether these spears hit or miss, all creatures within 5 feet of the target must make a dexterity saving throw or take an additional 2d6 piercing damage, as the spear bursts into a hail of thorns. This is mostly a mixture of the spells Scorching Ray, a very nice second level fire spell, and Ice Knife, a spell that I loved when I first started playing, but was a bit let down by overall. This spell bundles those two up rather nicely into a damaging spell for druids. It's nothing too crazy since any creature that passes the saving throw doesn't take the additional damage, but it's still a good option to have. The second and last spell here is a fairly simple one in Conjure Plants. It is a 5th level conjuration spell with a casting time of 1 minute, a range of 90 feet, and you need a preserved leaf or branch of some sort. It has a duration of 1 hour or until you drop concentration, and you need a 10 foot cube area within the 90 foot range to cast it in. Once cast, you summon a plant monster of CR5 or lower within the cube. I would recommend summoning a Woodwode or something of similar strength, being right there at CR5, and they're fairly strong. You can give the plant that you summon orders verbally, with no action required on your part, so you can still take your turn as normal. Just keep in mind that if you don't tell them to do anything, they'll just default to self-defense. Just be careful, since if you lose concentration, your summon could turn against you in the party. Honestly, I really like these guys. It always surprised me that there was no official plant race that came out for D&D, at least as far as I could find. If I missed one, that's... that's fine. This is my version regardless, and I'm fairly happy with it. And I think they could bring some interesting roleplay and visual aspects to any party. That will end our session for today, though. If you like this sort of stuff, check out my other videos for monsters, subclasses, and more. Thank you for watching, and have a wonderful day.